What is mysticism? The concept of mysticism is one with regard to which total confusion is widespread today. Not long ago I heard a cultured scholar declare that Goethe should also be numbered among the mystics, for he had admitted the existence of an area that is dark and inscrutable. And we can go as far as to say that a lot of people would agree with that opinion. The word mysticism and mystical, to an even greater extent, is applied to anything and everything. If a particular subject matter is baffling, to the extent that one's response hovers between not knowing and a dim inkling, one will call it mystical or mysterious. Or when people are tempted to fall back on an easy line of thought in the direction of psychology and admit they really do not know anything about it and follow the more or less obvious course of forbidding anyone else to know anything about it either, they will then dismiss it as mystical. In fact, things that people are only allowed to have vague feelings about are often made an object of mysticism. We only have to look at the subject of mysticism historically, however, and we shall acquire quite a different view of what great minds have understood by it, and above all, what they believed it offered them. We shall then have our eyes open to the fact that there have been individuals who, far from regarding the content of mysticism as obscure and inscrutable, have spoken of its goal as attainable only by means of a higher clarity, a brighter light in the soul, so much so that to them the clarity that other sciences can give leaves off where the clarity of mysticism begins. That was the conviction of those who believed they had experienced real mysticism. We come across mysticism in the earliest periods of human evolution. However, what was called mysticism in the Egyptian mysteries and among the Asiatic peoples and the Greeks, which have often been mentioned here, is so far removed from our conceptual life today that right from the outset it is somewhat difficult to give any idea of mysticism if we go by those old forms of mystical experience. We can come nearest to our present-day way of thinking if we start from the still fairly recent forms of mysticism found among the German mystics from Meister Eckhart onward, roughly the 13th, 14th century, and which reached a certain culmination in that incomparable mystic, Angelus Silesius. If we examine their mysticism, we find that they were looking to find a true knowledge of the deepest foundations of the world by way of a purely inward soul experience, above all by the liberation of the soul from all external impressions, so that the soul would turn away from the life of the outer world and endeavor to plunge into the depths of its own inner life. If the mystic would, as it were, forget everything conveyed by his senses and reasoning powers, and live entirely in his own soul, then he would feel that through the power of his own soul's forces he had the ability to see beyond his own thinking, feeling and willing to the place from which the soul originated, the divine spiritual foundation of things. And because the mystic considered the soul to be the most precious form of existence, the child of divine spirituality, he firmly believed he had found the source of the soul to which it must also return. In other words, the mystic was of the opinion that his outer sense impressions formed a veil through which human cognition cannot directly penetrate to the divine foundations of the world. The inner experiences of the soul, however, form a much thinner obstacle so that it is possible to penetrate through this to the divine ground which is the foundation from which external phenomena spring. This is the mystical path of Meister Eckhart, Johannes Tauler and Suso, and other mystics of that age, through to Angelus Silesius. We must, of course, realize that these mystics believed that if they took this path, they would find more than what came to them as an immediate result of their inner search. 
In the course of this winter's lectures, we have occupied ourselves with inner soul exploration from a great many aspects. We have been able to show that when we look into what is rightly called man's inner being, the first thing we find is the darkest depths of the soul, where it is still subject to emotion such as fear, horror, anxiety, and hope. In fact, the whole gamut of pleasure and pain, joy and sorrow. We called this part of the soul the sentient soul. We went on to distinguish in these dark depths of soul life what we call the rational or perceptive soul, to which we attain when the ego, the center of our soul life, assimilates external impressions and quietly allows what emerges in the sentient soul to live itself out and find equilibrium. We also said that inner truth, as we may call it, arises in the rational soul. When the ego then works further on what it has acquired on its way to the rational soul, then it works its way up to the consciousness soul, where a clear ego awareness is now possible, leading the way from what is merely the inner life to a real knowing of the world. With these three members of the soul life in mind, we have the substance of what we find when first entering into our inner being. And we find out how the ego works on these three members. Those mystics who sought for knowledge in the way described certainly believed they would find something else by delving into the depths of their souls. For them, the soul members we have just named were only a kind of veil they had to pass through to reach the springs of existence. And above all, they believed that when they reached this source, they would go through the inner experience that is presented in recorded history as the life and death of the Christ. Now, when the mystical descent into the soul occurs, even if only in the medieval sense, the process is, of course, the following. The mystic, to start with, confronts the outer world with the many impressions it makes on his ears, his eyes, and his other senses and he assimilates light, color, sound, warmth, and so on with his power of reason. But as he does this, he is aware that he is still a slave of the outer world and cannot penetrate through the veil to the source of these impressions. Yet his soul retains conceptual images as pictures of the outer world, and especially does it retain the feelings it has had whilst receiving these impressions. And the pleasure, the pain, the sympathy or antipathy he feels moves him more than the cold, dispassionate mental images did. His ego, with its interests and its whole inner life, directs him toward the world and the impressions it makes on him. So the first time he turns away from this outer world, he still retains the mental images and memories and all his subjective feelings. So at first his inner life appears to him to be a repetition, a reflected image of external life. Is the soul left empty when it exerts itself to forget everything mirrored in it from the outer world, to obliterate all the impressions and mental images connecting it to the world outside? The actual mystical experience is that the soul has another possibility that when it banishes not only its memories but also its feelings, it still has some content. It feels that impressions of the outer world with their bright images and their effect upon it suppress something which exists in the soul's hidden depths. Mystics feel that when they are open to the outer world, its life is like a powerful light which blots out the more delicate experiences in the soul. And, when they erase all the impressions from outside, the inner spark, as Eckhart calls it, shines forth. And they then experience something which has apparently not existed before, because it was imperceptible in face of the dazzle of the outer world. Mystics realize that there is no comparison between outer and inner experience, because these are radically different. We cannot enter into the inner being of things outside, because they only show us their exterior, 
and we realize that behind colors and sounds there is something which we have to regard at present as hidden from us. But with regard to our inner soul experience, we ourselves are inside them and are part of them. And if we have the gift of being able to open ourselves to the inner light, then we see things in their true being. Whereas the things of the outer world arise and then wither, are born and then die, this process does not apply to soul matters. Here we do not have to deal with exteriors, but with the thing itself in its reality. It is precisely through this inner knowledge that we gain assurance that there is something imperishable in ourselves and that it is akin to what we must acquire as a concept of spirit, the primal ground of everything material. This experience leads mystics to feel that they must kill off and overcome all their former experiences, that their ordinary soul life has to die, and then their real soul, the victor over birth and death, will arise in them. This awakening of the inner core of the soul after the death of ordinary soul life is experienced by the mystic as an inner resurrection as an imitation of the historical life, death, and resurrection of the Christ. Thus they see the Christ event taking place in their soul and spirit as an inner mystical experience. Seeing the way this path leads, we realize that it must lead to what may be called a unity of all experience. For it belongs to the nature of our soul life that we pass from the multiplicity of sense perceptions, the flow and ebb of perceptions and feelings and the rich variety of thoughts, to a simplification, for the simple reason that the ego, the central point of our life, is always working to create unity in our whole soul life. It is clear, then, that as mystics tread the path of soul experiences, these are presented to them in such a way that all plurality strives toward the unity prescribed by the ego. Accordingly, in all mystics, we find an outlook which could be called spiritual monism. And having attained the knowledge that the inner being of the soul has qualities radically different from those found in the external world, mystics experience in their inner being the consonants of the soul's core with the divine spiritual foundation of the world, which they, therefore, represent as a unity. What I have now been saying should be regarded simply as a descriptive account. It is impossible to reproduce in modern form what mystics reveal except by taking them as unique soul experiences. Then the otherness of the other's experience can be compared with one's own. But outer criticism is not possible, because not having experienced it yourself, you can only know of it second hand. But from the standpoint on which these lectures are based, we can form a clear picture of the mystic's path. It is essentially a path into the inner life, and the history of human development shows it to be one of the paths taken by the human spirit in its search for enlightenment. Various opinions as to which is the right path may be held, but if we are to give a clear answer to the question, what is mysticism, we must throw some light on the other path which can be pursued. The mystic's path leads him to unity, to one divine spiritual being. This happens when he follows the path that leads him into his inner being, where his ego gives him the unity of soul experience. The other path is the one that the human spirit has always taken when it seeks to pierce through the veil of the outer world to the foundations of existence. Here, in conjunction with many other things, it has been primarily human thinking which has endeavored to reach a deeper understanding of what lies behind the surface of things as perceived by the senses and grasped by ordinary intelligence. In contrast to mysticism, where does such a path necessarily lead? Taking the whole situation into account, it can only lead from the manifold variety of outer phenomena to the conclusion 
that a similar multiplicity must exist in the spiritual foundations of existence. In modern times, such men as Leibniz and Herbart, who followed this way of thought, have found that it is not possible to explain the abundance of external phenomena in terms of any underlying unity. In brief, they found the true antithesis of all mysticism, monadology, a view that sees the world as founded in the activities of a multiplicity of monads, of spiritual beings. I cannot go further into this today, but a deeper study of spiritual evolution would show that all those who sought for unity on the outer path deluded themselves, for they projected outward as a kind of shadow play, the unity that is only experienced mystically in their inner being, and believed that this unity was also the basis of the external world and could be apprehended by thinking, because it was really to be found there. But if thinking is sound, it finds no way of reaching a unity in the outer world, but realizes that the motley profusion we meet with must arise out of the interworking of a variety of beings, monads, who mutually influence one another. Mysticism leads to unity because the ego works as an integrated entity, as the center of the soul but the path via the external world leads by necessity to plurality, to monadology, and thus to a view that a great many spiritual beings must cooperate in order to bring about our image of the world, because as soon as we become observers of the world, we behold it through a number of organs and build up our knowledge out of a great number of different observations. Now we come to a matter of infinite importance, which has to be spoken of at some time, but which has received far too little attention in the history of thought. Mysticism leads to unity, but the fact of it regarding the divine ground of the world as a unity derives from the inner constitution of the soul, from its ego-centered nature. The ego sets its seal of unity if a person looks up to the Divine Spirit as a mystic. Contemplation of the external world leads to the plurality of monads. But it is only one way of observing the outer world and the way in which it appears to us that brings about plurality and which therefore prompted Leibniz and Herbart to postulate multiplicity as the foundation of the world. Deeper research into the matter leads to the realization that unity and plurality are concepts that cannot be applied when we are actually speaking of the divine spiritual ground of the world, that neither unity nor multiplicity can serve to describe it. Instead, we must say that the divine spiritual transcends what these two concepts mean to us at present, and these cannot fathom it. This is indeed a principle which throws light on many things that we see as a dispute between world conceptions, the dispute between monism and pluralism so often portrayed as opposites in philosophical debates. If the disputants would only realize that their concepts are inadequate for any approach to the divine ground of the world, they might come to see the subject of their debate in the right light we have now discovered what the actual essence of mysticism is. We can say that it is an inner experience, but one whose nature it is to be capable of leading the mystic to real knowledge. Even if he cannot justifiably say that the unity he experiences is objective truth, for its appearance of unity derives from his own ego, he is justified in saying that he experiences spiritual substance because he himself is within it. If we now pass on from this general account of mysticism to individual mystics, we quite frequently come upon the same sort of thing to which the opponents of mysticism refer, namely, that the inner experience of the various individuals takes on different forms, that the experiences of one mystic do not entirely agree with those of another. 
However, if we think clearly, we need not be particularly surprised. For if two people have different experiences of something, it by no means follows that their reports are untrue. If one person sees a tree from the right and another sees it from the left and each describes it from his own point of view, it will be the same tree and both descriptions may be correct. This simple example can help us to see why the soul experiences of different mystics vary. After all, a mystic does not encounter his inner life as a completely blank sheet. However much it may be his ideal to obliterate external experiences and to withdraw his attention from them completely, they will still leave a trace in his soul, and this makes a difference. He will also still be under the influence of the national characteristics he grew up with and the experiences he has had in life. Even if he discards from his soul every outer experience he has had, his inner experiences will still have to be described in concepts and words drawn from his life hitherto. Two mystics may experience exactly the same thing, even if they describe it differently as a result of their earlier lives. It is only when we are able, through our own personal experience, to allow for these individual variations in description and representation, that we can come to recognize that fundamentally the essence of the experience is always the same. It is just as though you were to photograph a tree from various angles. The photographs would look different, but they would all be of the same tree. There is another point which might, in a sense, be considered an objection to mystical experience. And, as I must speak quite objectively, with no bias one way or the other, I have to say that this objection is valid and applies to all forms of mysticism. Just because mystical experience is such an intimate and inner matter and has an individual character derived from the mystic's earlier years, it is extraordinarily difficult for anything he says, so closely concerned is it with his own soul, to be properly understood or assimilated by another soul. The most intimate aspects of mysticism must always remain intimate and very hard to communicate. However, earnestly one may try to understand and enter into what is said. Why is this? It is because two mystics, if both are far enough advanced, may have the same experiences, and anyone well disposed will then recognize that they are speaking of the same thing. But they will have passed through different experiences during their earlier years, and this will give their mysticism an individual coloring. Hence the expressions used by a mystic and his style of utterance in so far as they derive from his pre-mystical life, will always remain somewhat incomprehensible unless we make an effort to understand his personal background and so come to see why he speaks as he does. This, however, will direct our attention from what is universally valid to the personality of the mystic himself. And this is a tendency that can be observed in the history of mysticism especially with the deepest mystics, we must set aside any idea of the knowledge they have acquired being imparted and assimilated by other people. Mystical knowledge cannot at all easily be made part of general human knowledge. But this only goes to strengthen our interest in the personality of the mystic, and it is infinitely attractive to study a mystic's personality insofar as a universal image is reflected in him. What the mystic describes and values only because it leads him to the foundations and sources of existence will in itself have little interest for us as regards what it tells us objectively about the world. What interests us will be the subjective side of it and its bearing on the mystic as an individual. In looking then at the mystic and his mysticism, we shall find value in precisely what the mystic is trying to overcome, in the personal, the immediate, his attitude to the world. 
We can certainly learn a great deal about the depths of human nature if we look at the history of humankind through the eyes of a series of mystics. But it will be very hard for us, this can never be too strongly emphasized, to say that anything any of the mystics tell us can have any direct validity for us. This, perhaps, is an objective proof that mysticism is the opposite of monadology, which aims at reflecting on the outside world, which everyone has in common. Its systems may contain error after error, but they can be discussed and something made of them from whatever point of development the individual has reached. In this sense, one of their errors would be thinkable only as being due to the level of development of the particular individual. The mysticism I have been describing here can therefore be extremely appealing, but we shall recognize its limits quite objectively if we allow our souls to assimilate what has just been said about it. Further light is thrown on mysticism if we assess it in relation to the method of spiritual science a method drawn from the deeper levels of present-day spiritual life, with the aim of penetrating to the primal foundations of existence. If a subject gives difficulty because of the subtlety of its ideas, the best way of understanding it, as a rule, is to compare it with something to which it is related. You have often heard it said that there is a path of ascent to the higher worlds. In a certain sense, it is a threefold path, We have pointed to the outward path and also to the inner path, taken not by the mystics of the old mysteries, but by the medieval mystics, and we have defined the limits of the latter. We will now turn our gaze from both of these and look at what can be called the actual spiritual scientific path or the path of spiritual scientific research. We have already said that this way of knowledge does not consist in our simply taking one particular path, either the outward path leading to the foundations of the sense world and, therefore, to plurality, nor the inner path to the foundations of our own soul life, to the mystical unity of the world. Spiritual science emphasizes that we are not bound to follow only those paths which our own immediate knowledge opens to us, but that we possess hidden, slumbering faculties of not cognition, and that starting from them we find other paths than the two just mentioned. What is anyone who takes either of the characterized paths actually doing? He is confirming that he will remain as he is, as he has become. He can go forth from himself and endeavor to pierce the veil of the sense world and penetrate the foundations of existence, or he can obliterate his outer experiences and allow the inner spark that is otherwise crowded out by the outside world to shine forth. The essential thing in spiritual science, however, is that human beings do not want their cognitional faculties to remain as they are, but realize that just as they have developed up to the point they have reached today, they can, by applying the appropriate method, develop their souls further and acquire cognitional faculties of a higher nature than those they already have. If we were to compare what we have just said with the mystical approach, we would have to say, by eliminating outer impressions, we can certainly find the inner spark and watch the way it shines out when other things have been blotted out. But all the same, we were only observing what was already there. Spiritual science, however, is not content with that. When it arrives at the spark of inner light, it does not stop there, but works at creating the conditions that will turn the little spark into a much stronger light. We are going to take both the outer and the inner way, but as we are developing new faculties of cognition, we do not straight away take either the outer or the inner one. The characteristic nature of the path of modern spiritual scientific research is that unlike medieval mysticism, plurality or the old mystery teachings 
It shows the way to develop inner faculties of cognition so that the outer and the inner way become united. Thus we follow a path that leads equally to both goals. Why is this? This is achieved because the development of higher faculties, according to the methods of spiritual science, leads human beings to knowledge by way of three stages. The first stage that reaches out beyond ordinary knowledge is called imaginative knowledge. The second step is inspirational knowledge. And the third step is the real meaning of intuitive knowledge. How is the first stage attained and what is accomplished in the soul for higher faculties to arise? You will see by the manner in which they come about how pluralism and mysticism are transcended along this path. The example which is particularly helpful in leading to an understanding of imaginative knowledge has been mentioned more than once. It is an example of the methods applied by spiritual scientists, one among many, and is presented best in the form of a dialogue between a master and his pupil. A teacher who wanted to teach a pupil how to acquire those greater faculties of cognition which lead to imagination would say to him, quote, Look at a plant, how it grows out of the soil, unfolding leaf after leaf until it blossoms. Then compare this with a human being. Human beings have capacities the plant does not have, for they have mental images, feelings and sensations which mirror the world outside. They have what we call human consciousness. But they have had to pay for this consciousness by taking on board, along their way to becoming man, those passions, impulses and desires which can lead them into error, wrongdoing and evil. The plant grows according to its inherent laws, unfolding its being accordingly, with the green sap showing us its pure nature. Unless we indulge in wild fancies, we cannot attribute to it any desires, passions, or impulses which could divert it from its proper path. If, however, we observe the outer expression of our life of consciousness, of our ego, namely the blood, which is our equivalent to the green chlorophyll in the plant, we shall realize that this blood that circulates within us is an expression both of our advance to a higher stage of consciousness and also of our passions and desires which drag us down. Then, the teacher might continue, imagine human beings developing further and by way of their ego becoming master over error, evil and ugliness, over everything that is trying to drag them down into evil that they purify and cleanse their passions and emotions. Imagine human beings striving to realize a great ideal when their blood will no longer be an expression of any passions but of their mastery over everything that might drag them down. Their red blood is then comparable to what the green plant sap has become in the red rose. Just as the red rose shows us the plant sap in all its purity, then translating this onto a higher level, The red blood in human beings who have worked to purify it shows that they have become, shows what they have become when they have mastered all that would drag them down. Close quote. These are the thoughts and feelings the teacher can evoke in the perceptive soul of his pupil. And if the pupil is not a veritable blockhead but can enter with his feelings into the whole secret symbolized by this comparison, His soul will be stirred, and the symbolic picture that appears to his spiritual eye, E-Y-E, will be a real experience. The symbol can be the rose cross, the black cross representing what has been killed off in man's lower nature, and the roses representing the red blood that has been cleansed and purified, to the point where it has become an undefiled expression of the higher soul he now has within him. Thus the black cross with the red roses is a symbolic summing up of what the soul experiences in this dialogue between the pupil and the teacher. If the pupil has won through to this symbol with his heart's blood, if he has opened himself heart and soul to all these thoughts and feelings it involves, so that he does not merely set it before himself as a belief, 
but if with pain and struggle he has won through to a heightened experience of its very essence, he will know that this image and other similar ones call forth something in his soul no longer merely the same little spark, but a new force of cognition that empowers him to look at the world in a new way. He has not remained as he was before, but has raised his soul to a further stage of development. And if he does this again and again, he will finally attain to imaginative knowledge, which shows him that there is more in the world yet. And now let us call to mind how the path to this came about. Did we say to ourselves, we will take the outer path and seek for the foundation of things? We only partly said this. We told ourselves that we were going to go into the outer world, but we were not going to look for the foundation of things, not for molecules and atoms. In fact, we were not even going to take from the outer world what it offered us. The black cross is not something that would arise in our soul if we did not have wood outside, nor is the red rose something we could construct in our soul without receiving an impression of one from the world outside. So there is no doubt about it that the content in our soul has been taken from the external world. And we cannot say, as the mystic does, that we have obliterated everything outside us and turned our attention completely away from the outside world. What we can say is that we have taken from the world what it can give us of itself, but not in the form in which nature gives it, for the rose cross is not found in nature but only the elements with which we construct the symbol of the rose cross. What prompted us then to combine roses and cross to form a symbol? The process in our own soul prompted us. So, there is the experience we can have in our soul when we devote ourselves to the outer world, and what we can experience in the outer world when we do not merely stare at it as it is, but deepen our understanding of it. And this leads us to have an inner mystical experience of what arises from comparing the plant with the human being in the process of development. But we have renounced doing what the mystic does by taking up this soul experience directly. And we offer it to what the world has to give. And with the help of what the world can give inwardly, we build up a symbol in which outer and inner mystical life flow together. We could never say that the Rose Cross is a truth for either the sense world or the inner world, for no one could construct a Rose Cross in the inner world without receiving an impression of one from the outer world. The symbol is a fusion of what the soul can, from out of its own strength, experience inwardly and what it can receive from outside. Therefore, it presents itself to us as something that leads neither directly to the outer world nor the inner world, but works as a force. If we set it before us as a meditation, this force brings forth a new spiritual eye, EYE, with which to see into the spiritual world, which previously we could not find either in the inner world or in the outer world. And when it begins to dawn on us, that what we are now experiencing in imaginative knowledge is showing us that what lives at the foundation of the world and what we have in our own soul, being, are one and the same. If we now ascend to inspirational knowledge, we have to strip something away from our picture. We have to do something which is very close to what the mystic does when he enters into himself. We have to forget the roses and the cross. And although it is difficult, it has to be done. We have to put the whole content of the symbolic picture out of our minds. And now, we look at the effort the soul made to create the symbol of the black cross, representing the human being overcoming his passions. The soul's inner experience is what we have to look at. And by entering deeply into the mystical experience, had by the soul, we arrive at inspirational cognition. With the awakening of this new faculty, we not only see the little spark within us, but 
we see it brightening into a powerful flame of cognitional force, by means of which we experience something that reveals itself to be fully related to our inner being and yet fully independent of it. For we are aware that our soul activity is not only an inner process, but has exercised itself on something external. So that even here in this purely mystical concentrate there is a knowing that is entirely of an inner nature, which is nevertheless also a knowing of something that is connected with the outer world. Now, we have to do something that is the direct opposite of what a mystic does, something similar to what natural science does. We have to go forth into the external world. This is the difficult part, but essential if intuitive knowledge is to be attained. We must now turn our attention away from our own activity and forget the process of setting up the Rose Cross. If we are patient and carry out our exercise long enough in the right way, we shall see that we are left with something which we know for certain is entirely independent of our own inner experience, has no subjective coloring, and yet shows by its objective nature that it is akin to the central point of the human being, the ego. In order to reach intuitive knowledge, we go out from ourselves and yet come to something which is closely akin to our inner being. So we rise from our own inner experience to the spiritual, which we now no longer experience within ourselves, but in the outer world. At the level of imaginative knowledge, we do something which is just as much mysticism as it is monadology and raises us above them both. At the inspirational level, we take a step at the level which the mystic does at a lower level, because as a human being he stays as he is. At the intuitive level, we take a step which leads us out into the world, for not being the same as we were, we are now on the appropriate level. Thus on the path of spiritual research, by ascending through imagination, inspiration and intuition, we overcome the shadow sides of both pluralism and ordinary mysticism. Now, we can give an answer to the question, what is mysticism? It is an undertaking whereby the soul aims to find the divine spiritual source of existence through immersing itself in its own inner being. Basically, spiritual scientific cognition must also take this mystical path, but there is the awareness that preparation must first be made so as not to set out prematurely. Mysticism is thus an enterprise that springs from a justified urge in the human soul, one that is right in principle, but which mu should be undertaken only after the soul has first endeavored to make progress in imaginative cognition. If we try to immerse our ordinary human life in mysticism, there is a danger that we may not have made ourselves sufficiently free in ourselves to form anything else but a picture of the world that is colored by our own personality. If, however, we have raised ourselves to imaginative knowledge, we will have poured ourselves out into something drawn from the outer world, and we shall have acquired the right to be a mystic. Every attempt at mysticism should, therefore, be undertaken at the proper level of development. Harm is done if we try to achieve mystical knowledge before we are ready for it. In justified mysticism, accordingly, we can recognize with regard to spiritual science a stage that enables us to understand the real aim and intention of spiritual research. There is hardly anything from which we can learn as much in this respect as we can from devoting ourselves to a study of the mystics. The mystics can help us wrestle our way up to the findings of spiritual research. But we must not imagine that the genuine spiritual researcher, by recognizing something as justifiably being called mysticism, is denying the need for making any further progress. 
It is just for this reason that spiritual researchers find it justified. But people will need to have raised themselves to a certain level of development if the methods of mysticism are to yield results that are not merely subjective, but can be accepted as genuine truths regarding the spiritual world. So, we can finally say that the question, what is mysticism, can be answered by stating that mysticism is a venture of the human soul that is often carried out too early in the course of development. So we need not say much about the dangers a premature practice of mysticism can incur. It involves a descent into the depths of the human soul before the mystic has prepared himself in such a way that his inner being can become one with the outer world. He will then often be inclined to shut himself off from the outer world. And fundamentally, this is only a subtle, superior kind of egoism. This often applies to mystics who turn away from the outer world and indulge in those feelings of rapture, exaltation and liberation which flood into their souls when this blissful mood pervades their inner being, their inner life. This egotism can be overcome, however, if the ego is constrained to go forth and let its activity flow into the creating of symbols connected with the outer world, then a symbol formed on the imaginative level can lead to a truth that removes egoism. Mysticism is justified, and what Angela Silesia says is true, quote, if you transcend yourself in God's prevailing then in your spirit will ascension reign. Close quote. Or in rhyme, quote, Transcend yourself, be open to God's grace. Then in your spirit ascension, excuse me, then in your spirit ascension will take place. Let me read that again. Transcend yourself, be open to God's grace. Then in your spirit ascension will take place. Close quote. It is indeed true that by developing their souls, people do not only reach their inner being, but also spiritual realms which underlie the outer world. But they must be utterly serious about transcending themselves, and this must not be confused with a mere brooding in themselves, just as they are. They must take absolutely seriously the first half of the first line, when you transcend yourself and just as seriously the second half of the line, to let God prevail. For we are not letting him prevail if we draw back from any aspect of the divine revelation. We shall not be truly making way for God to prevail if we withdraw only from the outer world. We shall only be doing so if we are able to sacrifice our inner being to what comes to meet us as revealed by the outer world. If we have this attitude with regard to our spiritual scientific knowledge, we shall have the right understanding for the second line of Angela Silesius' statement. Not until we let the divine foundation of the outer and the inner world prevail in us can we hope to ascend to a spiritual realm which is colored neither by our own inner world nor by the outer world, a realm that is of the same essence as the infinite world of stars shining in on us, as the air enveloping our earth, as the green plant cover and the life of the rivers and the oceans. It is of the same divine spiritual substance with which we connect in thinking, feeling and willing with the world which is of a divine spiritual nature, both in its outer and its inner being. An example such as this shows us that it is not enough to take statement like this one by Angelus Silesius and just swallow it. We have to take it on the right level, the only level on which it can be understood really and truly and from all aspects. Then we shall see that mysticism, because it is right in essence, can indeed lead us to the point where we shall be mature enough gradually to see into spiritual realms and that mysticism in the highest and truest sense can make real for us what can be found in the beautiful words of Angela Silesius. Quote, when you lift yourself up above yourself and truly let the divine spiritual ground of worlds prevail in you, 
then in you, an ascension to the divine spiritual foundations of existence will be celebrated. Close quote.